Good morning. Welcome back. This is Jim Moore. Words of encouragement. And uh, today is program 161. Yeah, it's a good day. Good day to be alive. Good day to be serving Jesus. This is a program dedicated to the King and to his kids and to your encouragement. And I pray that it is an encouragement to you. So uh, it's been a few days. Um, took a break uh, for the Thanksgiving holidays. And uh, we always try to give our staff at the House of Prayer a little bit of a break. And um, they work hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some people think that uh, working at the at a place where your one of your primary objectives is to pray is a is kind of a piece of cake. Walk in the park. It's not. Hey, there's mom. God bless you. Um, some misconceptions. I dare not go down that road. But uh, some people think that again. Uh, you know. Uh, it's it's uh, it's not always easy to to live a lifestyle of prayer and and uh, fasting and <clears throat> a simple lifestyle. Um, not that uh, anybody uh, complains about that, but uh, yeah. Point being is our guys work hard and we want to give them a break. So it's good to be back, Heather. God bless you. Good to good to see you guys. I always wonder after being gone for a while if there's anybody going <laughs> to tune back in or not. But uh, yeah. So I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. I had a great Thanksgiving. I have to say, uh, in all honesty, I believe this was one of the best Thanksgivings I ever had. <clears throat> Notwithstanding maybe the ones when I was a kid and and uh, everything was, you know, when you're young, you don't have any responsibilities and, and everything is easy and you just, it's all about turkeys and smells and family and happiness and, yeah, and all that. You get a little older and you got some... Uh, stuff to deal with. And we have a lot to deal with. I mean, we've been dealing with a lot of stuff. So I was really, you know, praying for that and really asking that the Lord uh, give us all a great Thanksgiving. And I know probably not everybody did. And I, I apologize. I don't mean to rub salt in the wound if you didn't. But I just wanted to just make mention real quick before we get into the Bible this morning. And I'm going to touch on the subject. If you looked at the heading of this, uh, this is going to be a doozy today. Okay, so this is going to be one that that um, you might have some real strong opinions on. That's okay, you know. But before I say that, I want to say that, um, you know, I felt really different this Thanksgiving. So I got up on Thanksgiving morning, <clears throat> turned on my music in my little room where I'm sitting right here, and just began to worship Jesus. And as I did that, man, immediately the glory of the Lord came into my room. Now, um, I mean, it was overwhelming. I, I don't even know how to explain. It was just different, okay? And I had a couple of few other people say the same thing to me, that it was really, oh, hi, Merlene. God bless you. Merlene, I think that's how you say your name from Tillamook. God bless you. Thank you so much. Bless the city of Tillamook. Bless the county, Tillamook County. Often we have driven through Tillamook County and said, Lord, bless this. And we've got some great people over there, uh, Linda Hanratty and different ones. So we love you guys. Anyway, um, so... A number of people told me the same thing. Man, it was just different. Here's what I think happened. Okay, the long and the short of it. I can't tell you. Miracles popped out everywhere, and it was. But it, it, I felt very close to the Lord, and I felt overwhelmed by His goodness that day. And um, and of course, then being thankful. You know, there's nothing like coming into the presence of God to make you feel thankful. And you know what I'm talking about. Um, but it was just like that whole day was kind of like that. It was like the Lord was just really near and really close. And and I believe what he showed me was that this is the nature of God that he, you've heard of the scripture where it says he giveth more grace, okay? And it's talking about the difficulties that come into life, but he giveth more grace. And God is good that way. He's When difficult times come, he gives uh, not just matching grace. So if the difficulty comes up to here, and, you know, down here, it's it's different when everything's going good. You you don't need as much grace. You just don't. You're just like this, you know. Actually, I think it's always kind of like this. Here's your life. 
Here's grace. There's always more grace. God doesn't just give you barely enough to get by, okay? Uh, but of course, what you believe matters. If you if you believe that, then that automatically puts you in a position for victory. Did you hear that? If you actually truly in your heart, not just saying yes, but you really believe in your heart that that God's grace is always more than your situation. Okay, it's not up here, you know, it's, it is closer down to here to where you're at. I, I like to say he matches, but that's not really true. I don't think he matches. Here's your level of need and difficulty and challenge, and here's God's grace. I always think it's a little bit more. But when the level of difficulty goes up, God doesn't leave his grace. He giveth more, okay? So everybody say more. That's my last name. Yeah, that's my name. Don't wear it out. Okay, you give it more. So if your measure of difficulty goes up to here, then his grace doesn't just get to here. It goes up higher. Okay, so he gives, I believe, in abundance. So I think what he showed me on Thanksgiving was that he was actually pouring out the grace to be thankful that day. And again, if you missed that, no condemnation. Don't don't beat yourself up or anything. But the the point is, is that that... God is on the job, okay? Don't forget that God is on the job, all right? And again, um, this message today, I've really wrestled with this because I know it has the great potential for misunderstanding. And um, and I need the Lord's anointing, uh, really, to help uh, deal with this that looks like a contradiction. Trudy, God bless you. Uh, because the scripture now, you've heard lots of people say atheists, um, you know, people who try to debunk the Bible and so on. And again, I, I posture my heart to people that I respect. Everyone's right to believe. You know, God has actually given us the right to believe what we want to believe. God is not saying, hey, you know, do this or else. He's he has given us a will is what I'm trying to say. So I just want to say I respect your opinion. If you don't agree with me, it's totally fine. But you have to love me anyway, as I do you. Uh, but this this passage, or these two passages I'm going to read, are actually e examples of two uh, of more passages, of additional passages in the Scripture. So can we just pray? Father, I just thank you for your people today. I pray, Holy Spirit, for an anointing to say what you want and encourage your people's hearts and bring the light of truth. Uh, teach us what it is that you say. And um, even if it changes our mind about how we've always believed, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, are you willing? Are you open? Okay, so open your hearts. And I'm going to talk about, now I entitled this today, Here, are you ready? I'm going to drop the bomb right off the front end here. A case for civil disobedience. Okay. Live will lose some of you right now. I, I, was, I have a tendency to watch my numbers because sometimes when you say things, then, then boom, you lose a bunch of people. Not that I'm overly worried about that, as you could probably tell. All right, a case for civil disobedience. Now, I know that there are people that believe it is never God's will to stand up against civil authorities. And I, I want to state clearly that I believe in most cases it is not. It is not, okay? Herein lies the apparent contradiction in the Scripture. So if you look at the two verses that I put on there, one is, uh, and again, these represent vast numbers of scriptures on both sides of the equation. So uh, what, what I started to say is that contradictions, a lot of people think that this is one of the things in the Bible that is contradictory. It says to submit yourself to those who rule over you. And then it turns around and says that we should obey God rather than men. So the two verses I have, <clears throat> excuse me, are First Peter chapter 2, verse 13 through 16. It's just a smattering of uh, those verses, and then Acts chapter 5, 27 through 29. I can't put all of the verses down there because YouTube doesn't give me enough and, and uh, Facebook enough room to put everything down. So this is not an exhaustive Bible study. You need to do that yourself. You need to look up this so-called, air quotes, you know, uh, contradiction in the Bible because it's not. Often the truth is found in the balance of two extremes, Okay. Often the truth is found in the balance of two extremes. So you'll have people that'll say, Bible says that we should obey God rather than men. And you'll have people turn around and say, God says that we're supposed to obey, you know, those in authority over us. And, and the, the reality is they're both true. They actually are both true. Okay. So I want to get in just uh, uh, to a little bit of that today. And I also wanted to get into a little bit of the um, 
And you may not think you're a philosophical kind of a person, but I want to get into kind of the philosophy of, of ruling and what it means to rule. So, all right. So let's look at the first one. Uh, we should obey God rather than men. Let me just read it real quick. Submit, it says in one verse, in another uh, verse it says obey. Obey every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to governors or to those that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence ignorance of foolish men as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of evil, but as the servants of God. Okay, that's the one that says, and it's not, again, please, it's not just one. There are many scriptures that talk about submitting yourself to authority. Okay, so I want to start out in lest someone automatically thinks that I don't believe that. Because here's what we do. When we hold a, or when we walk in a lack of balance for what appears to be two contradictory statements, we tend to want to look at what we consider to be the opposing side, which is not really the opposing side, but it's out of balance. We look at somebody and we go, well, you don't believe that. Okay, so submit yourself to, to uh, your rulers. And then it says, should we, then shows them not submitting themselves. I mean, it, <laughs> It's a contradiction. It looks like a contradiction, but it's really not. Okay, what it is, and so we tend to look at if we're the like, uh, you know, submit yourself to your ruler guy, and um, and we see somebody who who's not doing that, then we're like, you're disobeying the word of God, and so on. And then if you're on the other side and you go, you know, uh, we're not supposed to obey man, we're supposed to obey God. You're pointing at the guy that's that's you know believing and submitting to the ruler and saying they're wrong. Okay, <clears throat> this is often the case that the truth is found in the balance of two extremes. Yes, yes, we are, and I believe the vast majority of time, okay, we are to submit to those who have authority over us. The governing authorities, there is no authority but given but what's given by man, or by God, excuse me, and if I get a chance, I'll talk to you. I'm not sure I can get all this out in this, this message, but maybe I'll do another one if I need to. <clears throat> So, you know, we're doing that. We're, we're, I believe that in most cases, that is the truth. Um, you know, we are supposed to walk in submission. And again, why do we believe that? Do we believe it just because somebody thought of it one day or maybe some, act, some ruler was the one that wrote that? No, God wrote that. The Holy Spirit. All scripture is given by God. So we, we come to that understanding that we're supposed to submit to our authorities by the scripture. That is a biblical principle. We didn't just come to it on our own, okay? You may think you just came to it, and it's just, no, no, no. Probably came from maybe your mom and dad, or maybe not your mom and dad, but you read the Bible or whatever. But ultimately, this is where it came from. Okay, so there's two kinds of submission to authority. There's the kind that is voluntary, and then there's the kind that is involuntary. And, uh, and you guys that are the, you know, we're supposed to obey God rather than men, which I am too. I'm actually both of these things. Now, some people would say, well, you just take the middle of the road. You're not making a stand. Oh, no, that's not. Yeah, okay. If you know me, you know that's not the case. So I'll get to, I'll get to that part of it, that scripture. But I want to lay a good foundation for submitting to authority first and why we do that and why that's important. Now, the title of this is A Case for Civil Disobedience. That's where I want to go. I want to go to, is there ever a time that you are supposed to resist? Is there every time you're supposed to rise up? Is there every time you're supposed to say this far and no far? Well, most of you would go, oh, of course, yeah. I, I don't think there are very many believers that think there's never a time where you're supposed to resist, uh, you know, authority or the enemy or whatever. I mean, most people believe if the, if the situation were extreme enough, okay, in other words, everybody's got a line you know, like the apostles had in the Bible, in this verse, where they wouldn't cross, okay? They simply said, no, we're not going to do it. We're not, we, this is where we get off. This is where you, as an authority ruler, cannot tell me to disobey God, to break his commandment, to whatever, whatever, okay? So most of us already believe that. I'm not sure we think it through very much and, and think to ourselves and really take the time to think, okay, what is that line for me? What would need to happen? Now, I can throw out a super extreme um, 
example of that, you know, like you see some guy, you know, uh, beating up and getting ready to murder a child in the street in front of your house. Okay, so that's pretty extreme, right? <laughs> that's about as extreme as it gets. A child murder, you know, all of that. Okay, well, of course, you know, uh, if the law said that that was acceptable, I would stand against that. So all I'm saying, be, bear with me, all I'm saying is that there are laws that have historically directly come against the commandments of God. Now, we're not talking about inconvenience. We're not talking about things you don't like. Okay, so let's let's go back. I just wanted to make sure you understood that that's where I'm going with this. At least you think that, because uh, I'm trying to, you know, the problem is when you start with one or the other, you know, again, uh, people assume that you you don't really, uh, there's not a balance for both. So, so <clears throat> Peter says, submit yourself to every, every ordinance of man. So, Governance is a big issue. <clears throat> we're living in a state right now where we're wondering where the lines are. We're wondering how far should we go, how far. I know I have been in contact with many people, some political, some, um, you know, governmental, some uh, official capacity, uh, you know, police and uh, people in the military, not as much of them, but uh, you know, um, school teachers, husbands, you know, just people who are saying, how far do we let this go? You know, what's the line? And the reason why is because we're already starting out with the position that we believe. So sometimes when I, when I talk about, and I might post something online where I say something, this is wrong. I don't appreciate what the governor's doing here. Uh, I don't think I've done much name calling, but I think I did one and, you know, God forbid that I should do that, but all right, I did. So, um, well, you don't believe in submitting to authority. I had one pastor write me a letter and just railed on me saying you're in a rebellion. And here again, I, I'm already in the position. I would not have gone this far had I not believed that that was biblical to do. Submit yourself to the king. Submit your, honor the king. You know, all authority that's given is given by God. Now, what does that mean? Let's start there, because a lot of people say, well, what about Hitler? We, and that's what we do, right? We jump to the most extreme scenario, and that's okay, because it sometimes that kind of eliminates the gray area, right? So, okay, let's do that. So Hitler, uh, you know, uh, Mussolini, you know, there have been so many despotic rulers. Israel had many, many bad rulers. Now, I've heard a number of people say, and I'm going to challenge some of our thoughts. I'm not, I'm not being disrespectful to people that say these phrases. I, I love them, and some are my friends, my close friends. But I've heard people say, we get the government we deserve. I don't think that's always true. Okay, sometimes, yes, I do think. I think in the larger perspective of things, um, God often gives us what we want, for sure, for sure. So here again, apparent contradiction. We get the government we deserve, and then the scripture says he sets up kings and he, he brings them down. Does that mean there's no human involvement in setting up authorities? Well, it depends in part on the structure of the government. If you've got, if you're in communism, you have absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with who rules in the natural as far as a political process. If you don't have a democratic process, you have nothing to say. One of the reasons we're fighting for the democratic process is because we do believe that godly influence and having the ability to speak into that is hugely important, okay? Um, so we're fighting for that. But there are lots of historical precedents where people didn't have that. They absolutely were under rulers, tyrannical rulers, despotic rulers, who basically said, you just get in line and do what you're told to do, okay? So did God put them in there to punish his people? I, I think that could be the case. I think there are, I know some of you don't believe that God ever would punish anybody, and I don't think that's biblical either. But nevertheless, without going down that road, you know, I think that right now, let's just bring it to, you know, you, you talk about Hitler and, and all of that. Did he, did he gain power because, quote unquote, the people deserved it? Well, did the Jews deserve to be slaughtered six million of them and burned in ovens? No. Did God say, well, I'm going to put Hitler in there because these people really deserve it? I, I don't think that's the case, okay? I think as in so many things, wicked rulers come into being because people either aren't paying attention or because they're not believing the truth, they are not operating in discernment. Sometimes people are conquered. Okay, again, you got to look at the big picture. I don't believe God put Hitler in position because the 
German people. I think the German people were deceived. If you look at the history of the German people, and I don't want to go down this road too much, but uh, it was a very religious country, mostly Christian, in, in, at least in the sense of what we, you know, doctrinally would call a Christian. We're talking about Lutherans and Catholics. I, I don't remember the percentage, but it was like over 70%, I think. So we're talking about what some people might refer to as a Christian nation, allowed a demonic guy because of the desperation of their situation to come into authority. Now, again, they had, they had the ability to say yes or no to that. And as dark things were happening, they didn't rise up against it. And they should have. They absolutely should have. But for various reasons, they didn't. Okay, so in our situation right now, and again, I know so many people are hanging on to the election. They're wondering what's going to happen. They're wondering, is Donald Trump going to get in? Is Biden going to go ahead and be the president? Um, for the sake of this particular uh, uh, talk today, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to forget about that. I'm going to say it doesn't really matter. What matter? I mean, it does matter. It does matter a lot. If you've listened to my past things, you know it matters a lot. But we're talking about our heart position. And I'm not giving the argument that we should submit to rulers because I know that most of us already believe that. The argument that I really want to get to, and I'm very likely going to have to have another program on this, is is there ever a case to say no? Is there ever a case to rise up? I, I would say obviously there is because it's happened many times biblically and in our country and so on. Anyway, so right now, people are looking at this and they're saying, well, we're going to get the, the ruler we deserve. I'm not so sure that's true. We've got millions May, I don't know. I, nobody knows the number because it's a hard issue. I was going to say a people that are saved. I don't know how many people are saved in the United States of America. Neither do you. Actually, nobody knows but God. Because salvation is not a name. It's not a, I go to this church. It's not, you know, I said a prayer. Uh, it, salvation has to do with the heart. It has to do with, uh, and God knows whether a person is saved or not. Um, so who knows? Hundreds of thousands, no doubt, at least hundreds of thousands, I imagine. So there are a ton of people. God uh, uh, spared the people in Sodom, well, not in Sodom and Gomorrah, but Abraham and his family because there were just a few righteous. How many much more when we've got hundreds of thousands of people who are answering the call? God says, you know, humble yourself and pray. Uh, seek my face, and uh, I'll heal your land. So uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14, and a lot of people have said yes to that. A lot of people have been praying, repenting, uh, and I would just say, have you done that? Have you personally done that? Okay, I believe that there is more at play than just who's going to rule the government. What's at play, and we need to remember this from time to time, and, and again, I'm huge about what's going on in the government right now, but I'm more huge about what's going on in the kingdom right now. I really believe so much of what's happened in our nation. How did it, you know, my wife the other day, Linda, she, uh, she, we were in the car and she was just kind of overwhelmed by so much stuff that's going on. And she said, how did, how did we get here? And uh, so we had to talk about that. And I'm telling you right now, I believe the main reason, some of you are going <laughs> to, you're going to hate that I say this, but I believe it's the body of Christ. I believe it's the church. We are the salt of the earth. Salt is meant to stay, to inhibit corruption. And uh, I think as many philosophers and Christian leaders have said in the past, as goes the church, so goes the world. I've watched as we have allowed different forms of iniquity, sexual impurity, government uh, corruption, deception in high offices, all these things, pulling out of governance. And, you know, churches have become entertainment. And I'm not just downing their church. That's not my, I love the bride. I love you if you're part of the bride of Christ. <laughs> I love the church. I actually had an encounter face to face with the Lord where he rebuked me once for not loving his church. I really love the, the church. I'm a big proponent of the church, but that doesn't mean we've done everything right. We are called to be the light of the, the world and the salt of the earth. And so I think much, not all, because we can't force people to get saved, but we, we do, we are the, still the salt of the earth. So anyway, I think we've come to this place at least in a large part because the church has not been awake, okay? And so a lot of people are waking up. So anyway, I'm getting off track. I rabbit trail. I rabbit trail. There's a lot going on up here right now. So this country that we're in, a lot of people are repenting. A lot of people are crying out to God, keep doing it, okay? The most important thing, you don't need to lead. Can I just give you some release here? You don't need to lead a mass group of people into, you know, humbling themselves and praying. You just need to do it yourself. Okay, it always starts with me. How am I not walking in agreement with Jesus? 
what compromise in my life is keeping me at a distance? Now, I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying he's far away. I'm not saying he's abandoned you. That's not what I mean at all. But you know, you could be closer. What compromise in my life is, is keeping that from happening? So humble yourself, pray, so on, so on. Help other people to do that. Encourage other people. That is at the core, I believe, of this issue because the United States of America belongs to God. And we are set. As a matter of fact, I've got two um, uh, links at the bottom of the page. One of them I'll tell you about is the movie Monumental. And I mentioned it before. I, I don't want to go into it and get off track here, but you need to watch it. If you think you really know how our country began, um, you might, but you probably don't. And so within the first 15 minutes of watching that movie, you will see things I, I'm pretty sure that you didn't know. There'll be a few of you that did, but a lot of people have no clue. The, the United States of America was literally started by Puritans, by Christians who were fleeing religious persecution. Okay, we kind of know that, but you don't get the whole story in school. All right, so all that to say our country was given to us by God. I believe we were set up for a reason, and I don't believe God's done with our country. Okay, so submit yourself to the ordinance of men. Now, I want to talk just a little bit about force, okay? What we have, and I'm not sure how far I can go down this this road um, without losing you guys, but we, we set up scenarios to protect people and to keep them in a place where, where chaos is not running. You know, I, I think sometimes we forget, you know, in heaven, no one is forced, okay? Nobody is forced, okay? God is going to do things in such a way to where when we get to heaven, the will that people have exercised to do what's right will be like extenuated and put or uh, put on steroids. There's no police force in heaven, all right? All right? But here on earth, there is, and there needs to be. There needs to be governing authorities. There needs to be laws. Okay, why are, why do laws exist? I don't need a law. Let me just say it this way: I don't need a law that says "Don't kill my neighbor." I don't need that law. If there were not a law on the books, it wouldn't matter to me. Why? Because I submit myself to God's law. Okay, I I am not my primary submission to the governing principles of life is God. I don't need a law that says not to take drugs. I don't need a law that says don't cheat on your taxes. I don't need those laws. Why? Not because I'm better than anybody, but because I have chosen voluntarily to submit to the will of God in these matters. You call them paradigms. Call them rules. I don't care what you call them. Okay, we, we get hung up on words. It, it doesn't matter to me. Jesus called them commandments. You can call them something else. I don't care what you want to call them. But he says, hey, that's good. That's not good. Do this. Don't do that. I'm all in. Okay? So what are laws made for? What, what, and I want to talk about why they're made and how they're enforced. Okay? And I'm going somewhere with this. Okay? I really am. Hang on. So laws are made uh, depending on where you're at uh, in different ways. Okay? Laws are made. Why are they made? They are made to protect people who would not do the law or obey uh, God's commands. Okay. So if I were not submitted to the laws of God, then I would need a law. Why would, why would I need a law that says don't go out and beat your neighbor up or don't go out and steal from your neighbor or uh, go, don't go out and murder your neighbor? Why would I need it? Well, because if I don't have something to restrain, actually, it's the neighbor that needs the law. Okay. If you get what I'm saying. Okay. So let's just say for a minute, I don't like God. I hate God. I hate his ways. I'm not going to do it. It's all about me. I'm going to do what I want, you know, because it's all about me. So, okay, it's me. I'm selfish. I'm self-centered, you know, dog eat dog, looking out for number one. So that's, let's just pretend that's who I am for a second. Okay. So you need to be protected then from me. Okay. So, you know, it's not so much, the Bible says that the law it was made for evildoers. Okay, so let's say I'm an evildoer, and uh, I set my sights on your property, and your, your, you know, was one of the Ten Commandments not to uh, covet your neighbor's land or house or his wife, you know, or spouse. Well, let's say I don't, I don't submit to those laws, and I'm, I'm 
and selfish. I'm, I'm going to do what I want. By golly, I'm going to do what I want. Okay? So the law exists to protect you from me in that case. All right? Okay. So I think most reasonable people believe in that. Now, now you've heard of anarchy, right? And again, I told you, you know, a little philosophical here. I'm glad most of you are still watching. Okay? Anarchists, or, anar or anarchists, how do you like that? Anarchists, anarchy, is the basic belief that, that you should not have laws and you should not have structures, that people uh, should protect themselves and they should have the right to do whatever they want to do. And I know this is not, it would take a whole thing to go into this. But anarchy basically doesn't believe that. It doesn't believe there ought to be a law. It should be the law of the jungle, the strong survive, and so on and so on. And it's a lot more complicated than that. But that's the primary idea. Okay, let's get rid of all that stuff. Well, most anarchists really would not believe that if they got in the right situation. But anyway, so don't want to go down that road. All right, so that's why laws made. Now, let me just say this. So what, what, okay, so somebody writes down somewhere that you can't kill your neighbor. Okay, somebody says the group of people get together. And this, I believe, is the best way that laws are written. They're written by people that have uh, a high moral standard. They're people that do believe in, you know, a biblical mindset about what's right and wrong. They get together, a group of people, their little tribe of people, small city, whatever, tribe in the Amazon, and they set some rules. They say, here's how it's going to be. We're not going to, you can't, you know, I saw, you know, uh, uh, Joe go over there, <laughs> Joe, Joe go over there and, and smack that little kid in the head, you know, because he didn't like him, you know, so we're going to make a rule that says you can't do that. Okay, so that's great. You make a rule. Big deal. The rule is only good, the law, okay? You know why we call people law enforcement officers? Law enforcement, you've heard the phrase law, to enforce that rule. Now, how does that happen? Well, it's contained in the word, okay? Force. So there's some really good books out there on the theory of force and so on and so on, and maybe I'll point them to you one day, but here's the point. You've heard of the phrase might, makes right. Have you ever heard that phrase? Might makes right. Okay. In other words, it's a, it's a misnomer really, but what it's saying is whoever's got the most strength, who's ever got the most power and authority, they become right, even if they're not right. Okay. So if, and I'm getting now into this idea of civil disobedience. Okay. If someone has the ability to make you do what you either don't want to do or shouldn't do, then that's where that phrase might makes right. So if they can force you to do it and they say, okay, so you've got somebody out there that says, hey, I'm right and you're wrong. School bully, okay? School bully says, give me your lunch money, right? Give me your lunch money. He's huge, you're tiny, okay? He's got way more might than you do. We're talking about force. Okay, for those of you that have the ears to hear, we're talking about guns. We're talking about imprisonment. Some measure of force to force you to do what you should or should not do. Okay, law enforcement is meant to uh, force, you know, people to do what is right. That is, if the laws are right, then they're doing it right. If the law is wrong, then they're forcing people to do what's wrong. But the idea is that they have force behind them. They have the ability, okay, what keeps evil in check to some degree, there are two things, the personal moral governance of an individual who says, I'm not going to do that. I'm keeping evil in check because I want to, I believe it's right to do, or I believe in God and I want to do what's right before God. There are a lot of people that, that do the right thing and don't believe in God because they just believe it's the right way to live. So there's this personal enforcement of doing what the person believes is good. And then there is a, uh, an external one. You know, so let's say I don't have that moral code and I want to do whatever I want to do. Then you've got people who have been established by the larger group of people to do what? To come in and force you to do what you're supposed to do. Okay, now that's how it's supposed to work. We, we have good people writing good laws and then we have people who enforce those laws because frankly, a, a law or a precept or a command or a paradigm or whatever, not a paradigm, uh, you know, a parameter, whatever you want to call it is no good if it is not enforced, okay? So in the scripture, we, we voluntarily submit ourselves to God and to the king and so on, okay? They are sent by God, it says, 
to punish those who do evil and to bless those who do good. But that, what happens when that goes astray? Okay, so it's supposed to be a good law and uh, good people enforcing the law. All right, you get, you get what I'm saying. So <laughs> laws are only good as long as they can be enforced. Okay. Laws are only good as long as they can be enforced, enforced literally. I mean, if you think about it, you're not concerned about the police because someone's going to come give you a tongue lashing, all right? I can handle a tongue lashing from somebody. What I'm concerned about, if I'm a lawbreaker, is that guy coming into my house, pulling out his gun, you know, saying, put your hands behind your back because I'm going to arrest you, and I know he is... There's, I can overpower him, and he doesn't have a gun, and he doesn't have handcuffs, and all I have to do is fight my way out of it. Uh, you know what I'm saying? But if he's got, you know, a gun or or a stun gun, or you know what I'm saying? It is. It comes down to force. Do you get what I'm saying? It comes down to force. Okay. All right. So you you get where I'm going with that. This works with the. This is why we have military. This works with police. This is how it works. All right. So. Now, let me get down to this, and I'll try to wrap this up. Oh, my gosh, I'm already... This is going to be long. I'm making up for lost time. Okay, I was gone for a whole week. So this one's... I'm going to go a little bit longer here. A case for civil disobedience. All right. What happens when the people at the top are doing wrong things? What happens when the laws or the ordinances or whatever the heck you want to call them, and the lines are getting mixed right now, there are places in this country where the line between a law and some kind of civic ordinance are really getting blurred, okay? Uh, right here in my state, in Oregon, uh, we've got a governor that basically said that uh, people in their homes during Thanksgiving ought to call the police on each other if they see that they have more than... And, and, and liken that, and I think uh, one of the... I'm not sure if I added that link to this. You can find it. Governor Kate Brown talked about this. And I'm not speaking evil. I'm just simply telling the truth because the Bible says don't speak evil of the ruler of your people. And I believe that. But I'm just saying that there was a line. And again, back to this issue, everybody has a line. So she was saying you, you should tell on your neighbor. She was comparing this to a noise ordinance, okay? A noise ordinance. So if I'm playing my music too loud late at night, you call the police to get them to come... Knock on the door and say, hey, turn your music down. And she was liking that to telling on your neighbors for having not submitting to what she felt like the COVID ordinance ought to be, which is limiting the number of people and blah, blah, blah. To me, this was a, uh, a rank invasion of privacy. Not only is the ordinance, uh, I believe, unreasonable, I believe it's unlawful. We have uh, systems in place so that governing powers cannot just arbitrarily make decisions that affect the rest of the population just because they want to. There's a legislative process so that one person, when one person makes all those decisions, that is the literal definition of being dictatorial or tyrannical. When one person, that's a king, okay, or a queen, all right? Um, so in my state, female governor is not the queen of Oregon. In your state, male governor, not the, not the king of your state, okay? We have a process. Now, there are many things that we may be asked to do. Um, you can't drive this fast. Uh, when you go to the grocery store, you can only buy this many items, you know. Uh, I live in a, in a community where I have certain standards set up by the community, right? That uh, you got to keep your lawn mode. You got to, okay, okay. I may not want to do that, but I'm going to do it, all right? The line always is with a, with a believer that if it crosses one of God's commandments, okay, if it forces me or is asking me, tries to enforce. Okay, the law is just where it's written down. It really comes down to the force. Okay, who's going to come to your door and make you do it? Who's going to write you a ticket and make you pay a bunch of money? Who's going to haul you off to prison and put you in there for breaking what they thought was a good ordinance or law or command or whatever you call it? Okay, that's where the rubber meets the road. It's not about what's written on paper. It's about what's enforced. Okay, I've been in scenarios 
where I'm going to be careful about how I say this, where, where uh, like uh, communities, you know, where a lot of things were written down about what you're supposed to do, but none of them were enforced. Okay, so it doesn't matter what's written as much as, you know, a law is useless unless it can be enforced, and it should be, okay? So, so in our situation, it was tell on your neighbor, you know? Okay, it's one thing to say here, you know, here's what you need to do to protect yourself, you know, social distance, wear a mask, blah, 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 all that stuff. Not diminishing any of that. I've done some of it. I still do some of it because I, from the very beginning, said I believe we ought to be smart. If my wife has stuff running out of her and is obviously sick, I'm not going to go come plant a, a sloppy kiss on her. I mean, that's just stupid, okay? It's, everybody say stupid. I mean, we know this, right? But I'm also not going to um, put on a hazmat suit or make her go move to some, you know, depending on the severity of the situation. If she had the bluebonic plague, yes, then, then I would isolate all. Anyway, here's my point. These things moved beyond suggestions to you have to do this, and then it moved from you have to do this to where you can be fine to do this, and then it moved from that to where you can go to jail for not doing this. At what point... And I know some people say, well, are you willing to die on this hill? I believe, yes, I believe for me, this is where the line gets crossed because it sets a super dangerous precedent. Now, in the Bible, submit yourselves to every order. Okay, that's what, obey, obey your rulers. And again, I've had people write me and say, you're supposed to obey your rulers. I believe that. I do. I do. I've been doing it my whole Christian life. So let's look at Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 29. When they had brought them, so this in this story... This is an extreme example, right? This is one of those examples where, where most of you who are listening to this program, if you are a Christian, a Christian, if you are a lover of Jesus, if you are a follower, he's the teacher, you're the, he's the master, you're the student, you're a disciple, you seek to obey his commands. If you are one of those people, okay, you have a line. And this is, this is no doubt where most of you, okay, would say that's crossing a line. Okay. Now just saying it's crossing a line is one thing. Actually doing something is another. All right. So they had basically passed, okay, a law. I don't know if it was written or if it's just something that was verbal. Doesn't really matter. They had the force, everybody say force. They had the ability physically through weapons and you know general consensus to enforce or to make happen by force what they were saying. And I, again, I say because I don't know if they wrote it down or not. I haven't, didn't have time to do the research. Okay. But the point is they crossed a line. And what happened? These Now, this is not Rome. This is uh, the high priest. Okay. So they actually had two governmental authorities that they had to answer to. They had to answer to the Roman authorities that were the civic uh you know, authorities in, in the land, and then they had their own uh, authority in the the church, as it were. It's not actually the church. It was Judaism because Israel was um, governed by uh, the, you know, biblical principles and religious men and women who had gotten way, way, way off off guard or off uh, off the rails. So the high priest is, is who's saying this to them. So you've got Peter, you've got, you know, some of the disciples, they're standing before the council, and here's what they told them to do, okay? Are you ready? Here's the law they passed. Here's the ordinance they passed. Here's their governor, as it were, saying, you can't do this, and if you do, I'm going to put you in jail, okay? Here's, you know, they say, well, you're making too much of that. You know what? This is how nations fall. I asked the question earlier, how did a, a mostly Christian nation, a mostly biblical believing nation, Germany, the history of Germany is rife with Christian, uh, you know, yeah. How did they go so far off the rails? Well, it was because the people that were warning them that they were going off the rails were criticized, mocked, told that they were being unreasonable, told that they ought to obey their authorities, told that they were just being radical. All of these things. There were a few voices that were warning the German people, hey, we're going down the wrong road. If we don't stop, we're going to wind up in a horrifying situation. People like Dietrich Bonhoeffer. All right. 
So the high priest says, didn't we not strictly command you, when they brought them before the council, the high priest said, Did, didn't we strictly command you not to teach in this man's name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with his doctrine and intend to bring his blood, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So the authority, the ones who could enforce their law, were telling people like you, here's what you can't do. You cannot preach the gospel. Okay, so most of you are listening right now. You're like, no way, I wouldn't do it. Okay, it's always really easy to say that, isn't it? Yeah, I question myself, what would I do? You know, I don't want to see our country come to the place where this happens, and you know what? I know some of you think that's overreaching, but it's not. We are literally moving towards, there are already laws written and in place that have not been passed, that the, that a whole sector of the governing authorities in our country want to pass, that says there are certain passages in the Bible you cannot read publicly. I'm not talking about preaching on them, expounding on them, saying what you think they mean. I'm saying you can't even read them. Most of them have to do with sexual immorality. And it's like we're asleep to it. It's like, well, that's never going to happen. I'm not going to worry about it until it does happen. This is where they were at, okay? They were, you say, well, that's different. Well, yeah, there's, every situation is a little different, but the point is they came to a place, okay? So what I'm trying to get you to see, because there's, there's people, and I keep getting this pushback. You're supposed to submit to authority. I get that. I do. I believe it. I do it, with, I do it in the sincerity before God. But is there a line I will not cross? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, there are a number of lines that I won't cross. Anything that God says to do that is a sin that they tell me I have to do, I won't do it. I won't do it. And I will speak out against it. Did you realize that all of the apostles, well, maybe not all, at least most of the 12 apostles were martyred, not just because they believed in Jesus, but because the, the law of the land forbade it. They were forbidden by the authorities to preach and teach and publicly be a Christian. There was a time that Christian Christianity itself was illegal in their day. You say, well, that's never going to happen. Well, actually, it's happening right now. It happens in various places that it is against the law to be a Christian. Okay? So this, this kind of a hypnotic veil over our eyes that says things like this can never be, we're actually watching these things unfold. I'm not an alarmist. I'm just saying this is the truth. And that's part of the reason that we don't see the truth is because we're too busy pointing fingers at people that are sounding the alarm saying they're, they're extreme or they're crazy or they're radical. And because you're radical, I don't really have to listen to you. Okay. And what does it say? I'm not a prophet. God forbid. I, I really don't believe I am. All right. But this is what it says about the prophet. You realize why they killed all the prophets? Because of this. Because they were telling them stuff that was coming that they didn't want to hear. Okay. Is there a line? That, you can, that, that your authority that you are submitting to currently could cross? Well, most of us would say, yes, of course. Might doesn't always make right. Just because you can have the might and the strength and the power to enforce your will doesn't make it right, okay? All right, so what is that line? Well, in this story, the line was that they couldn't preach. And look what they said. They said they brought him before. They literally brought him into court. Okay, so literally these guys were breaking the law. The law was unjust. Okay, now I don't believe what's happened to us over Thanksgiving is um, on this this level at all. Okay, because I know some people are going to go, oh, you're comparing. These are not apples for apples. You're right. You're absolutely right. Okay, but th so this is not the same. Having a law in place that is enforceable and people that have the will to enforce that law that says you cannot uh, speak out, you know, for Jesus. Now, in this case, it wasn't outlawed to be a Christian. It was just outlawed to speak about Jesus. Okay, because these things, they go step by step. Do you get that? Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is, people don't like to be warned because they, they say, well, it's not that bad. You're talking about way, way out here, okay? But it does go, it's the frog in the kettle. It does go step by step, all right? So at this step, they were not, it was not against the law to be a Christian at this particular moment in history, but it was against the law, the law that, that unrighteous rulers, actually religious rulers, made up that says you cannot talk about Jesus in the public square. 
Now, our laws say you can't talk about certain sexual issues in the public square. Okay? Hate speech. All right? There, there are people that are labeling parts of the Bible as hate speech. So, even though they're not pressing that issue, it is coming. It may be a few steps down the road, but that is the direction we're going. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so take a deep breath. I'm not trying to overwhelm you, but I'm trying to say that this... So I just want to get to their answer. They said, did we not say that you were not to teach or speak out loud in this man's name? Don't talk about this man, Jesus, and, and uh, so on and so on. And look what they answer. But, okay, but, all right. Instead of Peter going, oh, you know what? I need to obey uh, my rulers because that's what the scripture says, you know, and so on and so on. Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. In other words, what's he simply saying? He wasn't using obeying God as an excuse to just balk and gripe and bellyache about everything that happened that they didn't like. Okay, that's not what this was. This was them saying, here's the line. Here's the line. Every one of you have a line, I hope, okay? I believe, okay? And again, we use extreme scenarios to illustrate the fact that you have a line. Maybe you haven't thought about the line, but there is one. You see some guy beating up a puppy <laughs> out on the street <laughs> or abusing a child or, or setting their neighbor's house on fire. You, that's your line, okay? Now, again, these are things that are currently against the law, right? Okay, but let's say you lived in a place where it was not against the law to do that where it was, was uh, you know, and you say, well, there's no place like that. Actually, there have been. There have been places. Okay, and I don't want to go down there. But, so the point is you have a line. You have a line where if your governing authority said you cannot preach Jesus, for many of you, you'd say that's, that's my line right there. I've been quiet to this point. I haven't said much. I haven't done much. I haven't made a big fuss about it, but here's where I draw the line. So, I am looking at this. I am not calling for people to rise up in civil unrest. And that's not what I'm doing. I'm saying there is a point in which not only is it acceptable, it is the right thing to do. Okay. So what is that point for you? Well, my concern is not what that point is for you. It's what it is for God. So let me take the last five minutes here because I'm coming up on an hour. I'm actually almost at an hour. Let me just cite a few examples where this happened. So <clears throat> uh, Moses, okay, the authority that was in his day. Actually, uh, once I start down this road, nearly uh, or many, many old and, 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 and New Testament, okay? For those of you who kind of disregard all everything in the Old Testament, Old and New Testament examples of worshipers of God who rose up and said, no. This is where we draw the line. This is where it can't happen. Okay, so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Azariah, Hananiah, and Mishael. Ah, I got their Hebrew names right. Okay, so they were they were in Babylon. They actually served in a pagan governmental system by the will of God. Ah, I wish I could go down that road. Okay, some of my ministerial friends, this is a, an issue with them right now. It's, it's They were in a pagan system, but they had a line, right? What was their line? Well, immediately when they came in, their line was something as simple as food, okay? They observed strict Hebrew dietary law. Now, you wouldn't think that was a hill to die on, but for them it was. For them, they said, hey, um, we don't want to do that. Actually, that, that was not quite as big a deal because they said, give us uh, vegetables to eat for 10 days, and if we're not as healthy and smart and wise as everybody else, then we'll eat whatever it is the king. So they weren't like laying down their life for that one. They, that was not a hill they were willing to die. In other words, they actually submitted that to God. I think basically they were putting it in the hands of the Lord and saying, okay, hey, if God really wants us to eat their meat, we'll do it. If he doesn't you know, uh, want us to, if he wants us to maintain the Hebrew dietary law, uh, we'll do that, but he's going to have to do something so that we can do that. And he did, okay? But then there were other things that came to pass in the course of their serving. Remember, it was a pagan. We're talking about the Babylonian system. Pagan, 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 pagan. Horrible things that they did and believed were okay to do, okay? And uh, mandated in some cases by law. It came to a place. This is the nature of authority. Unless authority is under the authority of God, it typically gets more and more corrupt. You've heard the phrase many times, no doubt. Authority corrupts and absolute authority corrupts absolutely. This is really true. We have almost nearly every situation 
where somebody who had been given great authority, but was not under the, the covering of God's authority, that that authority corrupted them. Okay, so can't go down there. Um, so in Daniel's day, these, this authority got worse and worse to where, you know the story, throw them in the lion's den. Hey, everybody's got to worship me. Uh-uh. No, that was their line. Okay, that was their line. Now they were thrust into a pagan society. America is not a pagan society. We have hundreds of thousands of believers. Now the problem is we've got more. And I'm just going to be, I know some of you are going to disagree with this, but numbers don't lie. The truth is there are more people that are not Christians than there are in this country who are. Okay. So again, that's not a heart judgment and so on. I'm just saying, okay, there's a remnant. All right. So, but they were thrust into a pagan society. So one was the lion's den. Or he said, worship the king. No. Okay. Throw you in the lion's den. What was another one? Um, Bow down before the idol. Made a golden idol. Bow down. What's the big deal? You know, when you hear the music, bow down. No big deal. No. They said, that's a line we won't cross. Okay. What about New Testament? Well, like I said, nearly all of... I could cite a number of Old Testament. I just don't have time. So, New Testament guys, all the, the apostles. Okay. They, Christianity actually became illegal at some point. And, uh, and they suffered and died. Fast forward, I, again, lots of examples throughout history. Let's just move all the way up throughout history to now, or to uh, the founding of our country. So uh, realize our country was founded. You should watch the link, okay? You should watch Monumental, even if you can only watch the first 15, 20 minutes, okay? Our country was founded by Puritan they, they estimate that 30% of our country right now are the descendants of the uh, Puritan pilgrims. See, you hear pilgrim in school. Pilgrim, pilgrim. What you don't hear is the double P, Puritan pilgrim. These were Puritans. What is a Puritan? Someone whose primary belief was, without holiness, no man shall see God. Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. Not man, not your crazy wild-eyed preacher, but God said that. They, they believed in purity. They believed in, the, in the, the absence of sin because of the blood of Jesus positionally and the sanctification of their life and the working out of all things that God was unpleased with, what we call sin and so on. They believed in purity. 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 That's why they were called Puritans. Okay? Now, were they messed up in some ways? Yeah, absolutely. Just like you. Just like me. Okay? So it's not that they were perfect in every way they did. They did some really dumb things too. All right. But here's the point. They left, okay? They went from England to Holland, back to England, and then to America. They left persecution. Why? Because the king, King James, has basically deified himself and says, I'm going to tell you how to worship. I'm going to tell you what you can and can't believe. You can't have a Bible. Okay, you'll have to watch um, some of the movies. But anyway, they came to the place where they crossed the line. So, so I'm almost done. The very beginning of our country started with people, ref are you listening to me, refusing to obey their governmental authority. Your country that you live in began with a small group of people, I believe about a hundred, who refused to obey their governmental authority. Why? Because they crossed the line. Now, it wasn't just one or two issues, okay? Let's, and again, I'm not comparing it to where we're at right now. I'm really not. I don't believe we're there, but I do believe we're moving there, okay? I do believe we're on a path that's going that way. Okay, so they said, we cannot do this. We can't live like this. We can't, we're, we, it has come to a place where we are disobeying God in order to obey that man who calls himself a king. We got to, it's, it's, we can't, we just can't. Our conscience says we can't. We ought to obey. They were saying what Peter said here. We ought to obey God rather than man. If it comes down to God or man, there are some gray areas. There really are, okay? You can't drive your car, car as fast as you want. You know, you got to mow your life. You know, there's some, there are, you know, so, you know, buck up. Don't be a baby, okay? But then there are things. And at, at what point, I can't tell you what that point is. Okay? That's between you and your God. But don't you dare let somebody tell you. Okay, I, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to tell you where that line is. I know where that line is for me. 
Okay, so anyway, they left their country and they came to this one or to another country in order to have to be able to obey God and propagate the gospel. Read the Mayflower Compact, the initial agreement they had with each other as to why they came here in the first place. They were literally practicing civil disobedience, full on rebellion against their king, full on, okay, fleeing, departing. And because for them to do what they felt was right in their conscience to do before God would have cost them their life and they simply didn't want to die. And who can fault them for that? Okay. And then when they came, okay, after about 150 years, things progressed to such a place to where they were chased down. Where that same demonically inspired governmental authority, because it had come to that, it didn't start out that way, but authority corrupts, it had come to that, went chasing after them across the ocean. And they said, they, they sent their statement and said, we're not, okay, here's my point. Your forefathers did what I'm saying right now. They believed in authority. They practiced authority, what the Bible teaches about it, to a point. And then they, and again, I would suggest that almost everyone listening to me has a point. Okay. As a matter of fact, I know it. I don't think there's anybody who is so submitted to government that if someone came to try to, you know, uh, kill your wife and kids that you wouldn't do something about it. I mean, if you do, you, you, you are a call. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't know how else to say it, but you're, yeah. Anybody that would just let somebody come in and, and abuse their family. I, I don't know. I don't know what I would say about that. So what I'm saying is we all have a line. You and God have to where that line is. Okay. So if, let me end with this statement right here. If your forefathers and foremothers, your descendants, the people who came to this country had not practiced civil disobedience, you wouldn't be here. We wouldn't ha be having this conversation right now. And interestingly enough, out of the 100%, and these are, these are numbers, they're, they're not exact numbers, but they say about 30% of the people decided to resist the tyranny of the king across the ocean. About 30% of them decided to stay in obedience to the king under his tyranny and basically slavery. And then there was that middle ground of about 30%-ish who were just going to say, well, we'll just see what happens. They weren't for or for or against. They were just kind of, well, we'll just, we don't want to get involved. So I know this has been a rough one, okay? I'm trying to answer some questions that get asked to me, is it ever right to stand up and say no? And my answer to you is absolutely yes. Are we at that point? That's not my point to judge, only for myself. I believe it is right to uh, stand up and speak against some of the injustices that are happening, for sure, absolutely for sure. Why? Because I don't want to remain silent and watch those injustices increase more and more to where eventually I don't even have a say. I don't know what I'm going to do if they pass a law that says you can't stand up and read, um, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians, you know, 13, or you can't stand up and read this passage. You can't do that because that's hate speech. I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm probably going to stand up and say it anyway, because that is a line for me. I am called to preach the everlasting gospel of Christ. And nobody's going to tell me that I can't preach it. They're just not. Okay? All right. So, love you guys. Uh, again, forgive me if I get overly passionate about some things. I just want to try to bring some balance. You know, for those of you who are struggling with this issue, you really have to look at both sides of it to understand that God says, yes, authority is given by God. You're supposed to submit to it for the, you know, protection of, you know, a punishment of evildoers, protection of good. But there does come a point in which you have to say, no, I won't do it. All right? So God bless you guys. Thank you. I know this was a long one. I apologize. I'll try to keep it shorter. If you have questions about it, um, feel free. You can write me and um, I'll tell you what I think or what I don't know. So be of good cheer. Yeah, it is a difficult time that we're living in. But know that God is still on the throne in the larger picture of things. Everything. God is God is in control. In, well, okay, there's another whole thing there. But ultimately, he is going to bring his will to pass. 
I just want to live right for him until he does. So God bless you guys. Again, uh, praying for you today. Pray that you have a blessed day. So Father, I just bless your people today. Encourage their hearts and give them, um, just give them grace to, to live holy and happy for you today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Uh, share this if you will and uh, give yourself permission to have a great day.